that testimonies and singing would run out the clock tonight. But you, you quit early, so. Let me start by thanking you for your prayers the last couple weeks. Uh, God really helped us on our trip. President Martin and uh, David Black was with me in Papua New Guinea, and uh, we had a, a wonderful trip. God helped greatly. We had a couple days in Port Moresby and met a number of our graduates from Hope Sound who are back over there yeah, working in some of the churches, the radio station, the Bible college. Several of them who I can't remember right now said to tell several of you who I can't remember right now, hello. So to avoid me messing it up, if you know anyone in Papua New Guinea, they said to tell you hello. Uh, so I think that way I'm covered and uh, you'll feel good and I won't feel guilty. But God helped us and I appreciate so much the opportunity to be there and work with a wonderful group. I thought there was going to be about uh, 20 in the class and we ended up with about 75 who came to the classes each day, a series of classes on holiness and then services every night, and we had about 150 or so who came in the night services, and God met up with us and was a, a wonderful privilege. So thank you so much for your prayers. However, we left Monday afternoon Florida time and got back about noon today. So uh, if I fall asleep, just quietly slip out, last person out, turn the lights out and I'll wake up tomorrow sometime and go on from there. Ephesians chapter four. I read this last time I was with you. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. I am trying to wrap up what we have been looking at. We've talked about pictures of a healthy church through the New Testament. And the last time I was with you, and then tonight I want to wrap up looking at what that means for us. Uh, we've looked at, at the message of the New Testament about the church, but what does that mean for us as individual members? Last time we saw that because the church is a body, we are to be united, and each of us, it's not just that we're to uh, avoid creating disunity, we are to actively create unity. We're to love one another, we're to build one another up, we're to bear with one another, we're to submit to one another. We are to promote unity as individual members of the church. Then we saw that because we're a temple, we're to be a worshiping church. We don't come and watch the pastor and song leader and musicians worship as we sit back and observe, but each one of us are to be actively worshiping. Uh, and so we looked at that responsibility. Tonight I want to look at two more things. First of all, because we are salt and light, we must be a disciple-making church. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. To be a disciple-making church, I think, involves four things that I want to mention tonight. First of all, as members of a disciple-making church, we must each individually be growing as disciples. A healthy church is a group of people who are growing as disciples and who are making new disciples. Church growth is more than just bringing in more Christians. It is also building bigger Christians. That is, we bring in new believers and we also individually grow in the character of Jesus. I have thought that as a holiness church, sometimes we have the danger that our doctrine of entire sanctification, we can e equate that entire with the idea of being finished. We can start to think, okay, I've arrived spiritually, I've been to the altar twice, there's no more growth, now I just wait for heaven. 
But Paul gives us a model of how we should think about our growth as entirely sanctified believers. He says, not as though I have had already attained, either were already perfect. Three verses later, he counts himself in this group that's perfect when he says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect. Paul is saying to us, if you're really perfect, if you're really mature, you will realize that you're not yet perfect or mature enough. You will want to keep growing. Entire means through and through. It doesn't mean to be done growing. A perfect circle is perfect, but it can still become a larger circle. As it grows, it continues to be perfect. And a Christian who has been perfected in love will continue to grow in that love. The more we're like Christ, the greater our desire will be to be more like Christ. And so as a disciple-making church, we must be growing as disciples. And then as a disciple-making church, we will send missionaries who make disciples around the world. A healthy church is always a mission-minded church. We heard from Romans 10 during missions convention. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Healthy churches will make disciples around the world Healthy churches will create, will, will mother other healthy churches, both locally and abroad. We will be sending and supporting missionaries. The model, it seems for me, of the church is Antioch of Syria, Acts 11, the church where Christ followers were first called Christians, and that church became the home base for Paul's missionary journeys. That church recognized that they had a responsibility, not simply locally, but to be sending missionaries to other places. Third, as members of a disciple-making church, we as individuals will be involved in making new disciples. Because we are salt, because we are light, each of us will seek to make disciples. A disciple-making church does not wait for the pastor to make disciples. The pastor is called to equip the saints for the work of ministry, but each of us is to be a disciple maker. Each of us is to be involved in winning and making disciples. Early in the 20th century, the pastor of a uh, First Baptist Church in Dallas, George Truett, wrote this. The supreme indictment against a church is that the church lacks passion and compassion for human souls. A church is nothing better than a social club if its sympathies for lost souls does not overflow, if it does not go out to seek to point lost souls to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He insisted that no matter what else we do well, we are failing as a church if we are not making disciples. Not all of us are called to be a Francis Asbury, but every time I read his story, I'm, I'm convicted again. He arrives in America in 1771, and when he gets here, there are 600 Methodists in America. He dies 45 years later, there are 200,000 Methodists. He's traveled over 30,000 miles, preached 16,000 sermons, they said that in this time where there was no photography or no Facebook, more Americans recognized the face of Francis Asbury than recognized the face of George Washington. Why? Because he reached America convinced that he was called to make disciples, and he gave his life to that calling. Now, all of us have a different role in this, and I, I don't tell that to say, well, if you're not out there bringing in hundreds of new believers, you're failing. Each of us has a different role in making disciples. I just got off an airplane, five airplanes, and every time I sit down on an airplane, I remember a couple friends of mine who, every time they're on a plane, someone next to them leans over and says, 
I was hoping someone would sit down today and tell me how to become a Christian. It just seems to happen every time they, they sit, sit down. And I admire that. But I don't have a gift for evangelizing on airplanes. Uh, nobody ever asks. And when I try to talk to them, they just kind of grunt at me and say, would you get over in your seat? We don't all have the same gift. We don't all do the same part of the work of the body. But as members of a disciple-making church, each of us has some role to serve in the overall ministry of making disciples. Some of you will enjoy going on cruises. And one of the nice things about a cruise is once you get there, they carry your suitcase, they cook the meals, they do the dishes, they make your bed, they do everything. However, I don't want to shock you tonight, but Hope Sound Bible Church is not a cruise ship. Our job as members is not to come in and find our seat, sit down, and allow someone else to do everything for us. Instead, every one of us must find a way to be active in serving. I read a study that an organization did of failing churches. They found 10 characteristics in common among churches that were, were failing in their mission. But as I read through the list, what summarized all of the, the characteristics of this church was this, these churches was this, an attitude of entitlement that said, I want what I want. I go to church for me. And so I want music that is my style. I want sermons that are my style. I want everything to be focused on me. But the attitude of Jesus in Philippians 2 is entirely different. Paul writes to the church at Philippi and says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. The spirit of service, the spirit of looking for how can I be a part of a church, of, uh, how can I serve actively in fulfilling the calling of Hope Sound Bible Church. I read that nationwide, less than one-third of church members have any active role in their local church. I don't know how that compares here, but the question is not for us, should I be serving in the church? The question is, how can I best serve? Each of us has a role. Someone told me, said, you know, at Hope Sound Bible Church, it's a big church. And I just don't feel they need, feel they need me. There's always someone better than me at every job. But the question is not, is there someone else better than me? The question is, what can I do? What role does God have for me in serving his church? We are all called to be part of a disciple-making church. The fourth thing I want to see, because we are an embassy of the kingdom of God, we as individuals, again, I'm looking at what do we as individuals do as a part of what the church as a whole does. Because the church is an embassy in our community, we as individuals will represent Christ to our community. Titus chapter 2, a scripture that I will probably come back to repeatedly because it has had such an impact on me. Titus 2 has two verses that are powerful. Because whether or we want to or not, as Christians, every one of us represents the kingdom. And the only question is, will we represent it for good or for ill? Paul is writing to Titus. Titus is a pastor on the island of Crete. And Paul says to Titus, you must, you must challenge these believers to live godly lives. And here's why. He gives them two reasons. Verse 5, he tells them that bad behavior by Christians will bring shame on the gospel. 
He says they are to live godly lives so that the word of God, the gospel, may not be reviled or may not be blasphemed. If we live the wrong way, he says, we bring shame on the gospel. But then in verse 10, he turns it around and he tells us that good works by Christians, if we live the way we're supposed to, he says in everything, they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. To adorn is to make something attractive. There are very few people who are going to pick up our set of beliefs and read it and say, ah, that's what I want. Most of them are going to look at one of us and say, I want what they have. And so our lives, our actions, our words will either make the gospel attractive or, in Paul's words, will blaspheme the gospel. I was listening to a worker in a business less than a million miles from here. And he described a Christian, he knew she was a Christian by her dress. And he said, you know, when she walks in our store, all of the workers say, oh no, the holy woman is back. It's your turn to deal with her. She always complains. There's always something wrong. She's the worst customer we have. Is she a Christian? I'm sure she is. But she is making the gospel unattractive in the eyes of unbelievers. But I was really happy as I kept eavesdropping when the same worker told about another Christian. And he said this, you know, if we ever mess up anyone's order, we would want it to be his because he is the kind of Christian you ought to be. There is someone who is adorning the gospel, who is making it attractive, who causes unbelievers to look and say, that's the way a Christian ought to be. According to Titus, when you go to Walmart, your actions are either drawing people to the gospel or driving them away. When we talk to our neighbor over the fence, we are either drawing them to the gospel or pushing them away. When we deal with businesses in the community, our attitude is either making the gospel attractive or driving them away. Everything we do, Paul says, speaks of the gospel. In Taiwan, many Christians will have a fish symbol on their cars. I spent the day with a Christian businessman, a good man, but throughout the day, someone cut in front of him in the traffic and he kind of shook his fist as he was blowing the horn. He parked illegally to get a better spot. At lunch, our waitress did something wrong and he loudly complained. That afternoon, I, I said, you know, would you mind if we took the fish off the back of your car? And he, he was kind of offended. He said, you don't think I'm a Christian? I said, I know you're a Christian, but that's the problem. You see, when you shake your fist at another driver and the driver sees the fish on the car, he knows you're a Christian too. And it's the same as if Jesus was shaking his fist. When you yell at the waitress and then she sees you drive off in a Christian car, she thinks, Jesus was at my table, and he's kind of rude. So I'm just thinking that if you're going to be unkind to people, maybe it's best if no one finds out you're a Christian. Let's just take the fish off the car. You see, our lives either honor or shame the gospel. But the good news is we have the wonderful privilege, every one of us, to bring honor to the gospel. We can represent it well. I have the lady's permission to share this story. I'm going to change her name because she may visit us sometime and I don't want you to say, oh, I already heard about you. Ray is a Chinese man, grew up in western China near the Russian border. All he knew about Americans was that all Americans are spies. Ray and his wife came to America to go to graduate school, and like most graduate students, they were poor. 
One day someone showed up at their front door, handed them a bag of groceries and said, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you and left. Ray said he went into the kitchen. He was shaking as he handed the groceries to his wife. She said, what's wrong? And he said, the CIA is trying to recruit us. They're going to give us food and then they're going to start asking us questions about our home country. Next week, same man showed up again. God asked me to give you these. Ray said, who are you? Why are you bringing us food? And the person said, I just want you to know Jesus loves you. Ray said, I know that's not right. Jesus doesn't even know who I am. This went on for several weeks. Ray and his wife were waiting to figure out, you know, what are they going to ask us to do? Christmas time, the neighbor showed up again. All they've done is bring him some groceries. But this time he said, I'd like to invite you to come with me to my church's Christmas program. Ray said he and his wife decided to go to the CIA church. They assumed that was part of the recruitment process, but they felt kind of obligated. They went, they heard the gospel, gave their hearts to Christ. Ray finished his education, he moves to Palm Beach, takes a job in the county office there. Jump ahead a few years. Priscilla is a Chinese girl raised in Pakistan as a Catholic, comes to America. She's living in Texas and becomes friends with a lady there and begins attending an evangelical church. While she's there, the pastor gives her a Bible. It's the first time she's ever owned a Bible. She said she went home and for three days she spent 10 hours a day just reading through the Bible. She moves to Florida and she said, I still didn't know which was right, the evangelical church or the Roman Catholic church I had been raised in. So she said when she got to Florida, she looked up and she prayed this, God, I'll give you one week. If you want me to go to a Christian church, you'll have to show me in a week. Otherwise, I'll go back to the Catholic church where I'm comfortable. Three days later, she's in a county office filling out paperwork for her business that she's starting. And a chi Chinese man by the name of Ray helps her. When they're done, he says, so you're new to Palm Beach County. Yep. You should come to my church. Where's that? And he introduces her to Palm Beach Chinese Christian Chapel. Priscilla said, I walked outside, looked up and said, okay, God, you win. You see, because a man and his wife, who may have had no great evangelistic gifts, but they knew how to buy a bag of groceries, take them to someone and say, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. Because of that, Ray and his wife become Christians. And then because he is salt and light, Priscilla is a Christian. We don't have to be great evangelists. But as members of God's church, every one of us is called to do something to build his church. I hope as we, as I've tried to finish this up, I would ask you to think about this. What is God's place for me in the church? I was pastoring in Taiwan and there was a young lady who started to come to church. She gave her heart to the Lord and the next week I came, got to church and, and the church there was on the ground floor of an apartment building, it was on a busy corner and a lot of dogs would come around through the town or during the week and leave their deposits. And I got to church before service on Sunday morning and Alice was out mopping off, spraying and cleaning up the sidewalk. And I said, why are you doing that? Who asked you to do that? She said, I'm a brand new Christian and I don't know anything I can do for Jesus. But I decided I could at least do this. I looked at her and I thought, you know, all of us can do something. And I hope that as you think about the church and what, what we are as a church, that you'll begin to say, God, 
What can I do? What is the place you have for me? Which of my neighbors can I begin to influence for you? What can I do to help Hope Sound Bible Church accomplish the mission God has given us?